like that. I hope that sticks. All right. If you're visiting, we've been going through uh, the Samuel series, and today we will be completing uh, First Samuel. So uh, we'll go through chapters 29 through 31. Uh, please turn over to uh, chapter 29, First Samuel, chapter 29. Was it just me, or did John Green sound like he should have my job? Uh <laughs> Oh, he's coming after me now. That was amazing. That was amazing. So last week, um, our protagonists, David and Saul, were in uh, dark situations. Uh, David and his men had been living with the Philistines, the enemies, for over a year. And they were getting ready for battle. They were going to go to war against God's people. And uh, Saul, he was afraid. And so what does he do? He goes and he hires a medium and uh, summons Samuel. And Samuel's like, what are you doing waking me up? <laughs> You're going to die and your kids are going to die. And it was just a dark, dark time. So let's, uh, let's look here at this royal battle. 1 Samuel chapter 29. The Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear with Achish. The commanders of the Philistines asked, what about these Hebrews? Achish replied, is this not David, who is an officer of Saul, king of Israel? He has already been with me for over a year, and from the day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault in him. But the Philistine commanders were angry with Achish and said, send the man back that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle, or he will turn against us during the fighting. How better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this David they sang about in their dances? That's pretty cool. They dance while they sing. Yeah. That. Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And his tens of thousands that he had slain were the Philistines. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 6. So Achish called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until today, I have found no fault in you. Isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. That is with all of our hearts. Young men, this right here yeah. needs to be your hearts. To be reliable. Where anyone would want to go to battle with you. Anyone would want you by their side. He says here, but the rulers don't approve of you. Now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what have I done, asked David. What have you found against your servant from the day I came uh, to you until now? Why can I go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the king? Mm -hmm. Achish answered, I know that you have been, a ple have been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said, he must not go up with us into battle. Now get up early along with your master's servants who have come with you and leave in the morning as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Israel. So here, David, he wants to go to battle. He wants to fight. He's, he's having a bad day. I want to fight. David was a fighting man. And uh, he was loyal to that king. And he was loyal to God. And it, it kind of doesn't make sense sometimes. Why would he be loyal to God and loyal to this enemy king? Well, he believed and he trusted in God that no matter what the situation, God's outcome would be victorious. Yeah. And I'm going to be loyal to whoever God has cho chosen in my life to be the leader. And so he believed that the outcome would be God's outcome. And uh, so the title of my lesson is Loyalty to Royalty. Loyalty to Royalty. Uh, you know, David had uh, six hundred loyal soldiers yep. they're right there by his side how did this happen well let's go back as a little reminder to first samuel chapter 22 
Loyalty to royalty. In verse uh, one, it says, uh, David went to Nob. I'm sorry, that was chapter 21. Chapter 22. Did I say uh, 21 or 22? 22. Okay, that's the right one. I was in the wrong one. Okay. Uh, verse one David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adlam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God's will is for me? And so he goes to this cave. God had allowed him to be stripped of everything, everything that was important in his life. He lost it. His wife, his job, his career, his kingdom, everything was gone. He's hiding in a cave and he's reaching out to God. And he's uh, writing these amazing psalms that we get to read in the morning and encourage our souls with, right? That's where it's happening, right here in this cave. And uh, he, he has this loyal band of dis distressed, discontented, indebted guys. And these are the guys that become uh, the warriors, the mighty men of God that we read about in, um, in Second Samuel. And so these are the, the army that he has, the 600. Uh, that were by his side, that were loyal. And uh, you see his his heart, even for his parents. He's loyal to his parents. He's like, take care. He goes to another king, he goes, take care of my mom and my dad. Loyalty to royalty. That needs to be our heart. And so my first point is hold fast to God. Hold fast to God. Come on, dude. Uh, in the dictionary, the phrase hold fast means to remain tightly secured, to continue in an idea or principle. Um, I looked up the origin. The phrase hold fast traces back to Norwegian and Dutch sailors who had the saying, hold vast, meaning hold tight. Upon first impression, the meaning of hold fast seems obvious. But to a sailor, fast is a term meaning to make tight. If a sailor was to make fast the line, it would mean to make the rope tight. Sailors being a superstitious group began to uh, tattoo, hold fast on their knuckles. This was done for good luck while holding the lines and as a reminder that no matter what, the sailor would not let go. And so my first point, hold fast to God. Look at uh, chapter 30. First Samuel chapter 30. Hold fast to God. Ah, oh, they're practicing uh, Christmas songs. Thank you, Lord. Okay, verse one. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So what had happened? Well, when the Philistines had gathered their army to go to battle, remember it was an epic battle. So every single soldier was there at this epic battle. And so now their land is left uh, unguarded. And so the Amalekites take advantage of that and they go and take all their men and women and everything else. Uh, verse four. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives have been captured, uh, Hinnom of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord, his God. Mm. Hold fast to God. Mm. It's interesting, they were super loyal just a chapter before, mm. and, uh, and now they wanna kill him. Mm. This is what happens. Uh, this is what happens when you're in leadership. Uh, you give, and then circumstances all of a sudden 
uh, people hate you and uh, want to kill you. Mm -hmm. um, and so what does David do? He holds fast to God. He says here he finds strength in the Lord. Uh, you know, this, uh, this week was probably my hardest week emotionally since I moved up here to Syracuse. Um, during this week, uh, I fought with my wife. <laughs> I fought with uh, Luke, the leader of the New York church. Uh, that's why on Facebook, you see pictures of me and Luke uh, several times this week. Uh, this is what was happening. I was dealing with my heart, with my mind. Um, uh, I was not happy. And uh, I was not uh, trusting in God. Bottom line, at the, in the moment, you don't realize that's what you're doing. You know, um, I'm a disciple, you know, and wow. so you would think I know what I'm doing. Uh, but as um, John said, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> and so I was having a hard week. And, uh, and so I want to share with you how I got through it. Because, you know, your, right. your, your emotions go from anger to just unmotivated. Have you ever been there? Yeah. You just need motivation. And so I want to help you out. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 16. Come on, bro. Second Chronicles chapter 16. And since you are all not Jesus, I know this is going to be helpful for you as well. Second Chronicles 16 in verse 9. It says, for the eyes of the Lord reigns throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed Amen. to him. A lot of us were like, God, strengthen us so I can be fully committed to you. But that's not how it works. You get your heart fully committed to God first, and then he strengthens you. You get your heart fully committed to God first, and then he will motivate you. There's nothing any human being is going to do to motivate you right. <laughs> to be fully committed to God. You've got to make the decision to be fully committed to God. And this is what David does. It says that uh, he found his strength in the Lord. And so what is he doing? He's being fully committed to God. You know, I, uh, uh, I got my heart and my mind straight by doing that. Uh, I, I wasn't getting it. And so I just had to pray, and I had to remember this scripture. God, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but I'm going to be fully committed to you. And it was amazing. The peace of God, just which transcends all understanding, <laughs> protected my mind and my heart. As soon as I was fully committed Amen. to God. And then, uh, you know, um, a couple days before I had that prayer, I got a a message from um, from Levi. It was the uh, anniversary of the death of his uncle, Rod Fick. And he said, this is a message uh, if you want to listen to it. And uh, I wasn't I wasn't in the right mind to listen to it. But then once God had straightened me out, I, I listened to it. And uh, thank you. It was just what I needed. Uh, it was uh, a lesson that he preached right here in Syracuse in the year 2000, mm -hmm. the day before Christmas. And uh, mm -hmm. if you don't know, uh, Tisha's brother, uh, Levi's uncle, uh, an amazing evangelist that went to Africa uh, to help start the churches out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to visit and he was sharing about suffering mm -hmm. and the stuff that he went through in Africa. And I was like, I'm such a baby. You know, I mean, look what he's going through. He gave up the American dream to go there. And he's talking about one day losing his wife. He was, uh, he dropped her off with, she was in the state of the Bible with a sister or with a, a visitor. And, uh, and then, so there's no like road signs. He just remembered left, right, left, right. And there's no cell phones at this time. <laughs> and he goes back at night now, 11 o'clock night to go pick her up. And he couldn't find her. And just the fear that was going through his heart and just wanting to give up at that moment. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing in this strange country? Mm. And just his heart to not give up. And, uh, you know, it just put things in perspective for myself. Like, yeah. we've got it so good here in Syracuse. Yeah. You know, I got to be grateful. 
And so holding fast to God, look what happens with David when he holds fast. First Samuel chapter 30. Come on. Verse 7. Then David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Remember, the ephod is uh, the breastplate where you go in and you ask God, and he tells you if you should go or not. Um, verse 8. And David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue and so you you see his heart he gets strengthened by god and then he inquires of god that's got to be our heart we get strengthened by god and we make sure we ask god what to do next that he would give us the answers we look into the scriptures uh, verse 9 david and his 600 men with him came to besor valley where some stayed behind 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley but david and the other 400 continued the pursuit Remember, they had been crying and weeping so much that they were exhausted. They had just lost everything and their kids and their wives. And they were just, it was just too much to keep going. So 200 of them stayed back and the other 400 kept going. Verse 11, they found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Carethites, some territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master and I will take you down to them. See, by law, if you find uh, a slave, you're supposed to either kill them right there or you're supposed to take them to their master so they can kill. Them. And so he's like, please, let's come up with a plan that that doesn't happen. <laughs> Verse 16, he led David down and there they were scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. So imagine that, they were such a large army. He says, we got rid of most of them, but 400 got away. I mean, they only had 400. They were fighting with 400. And they were, uh, they were winning the battle there. Verse 17, David fought from, oh yeah, verse 18. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder, anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds and his men drove ahead of the other livestock saying, this is David's plunder. There's the loyalty again. <laughs> so they went from wanting to kill him to going, this is David's plunder. They're so fired up. They got the victory. And so for us, uh, I have a question for you. Are you fully committed, holding fast to God, inquiring of the Lord, loyalty to royalty? Amen. I only have one charge for you today. and I'm going to hold it till the end. But I do have two questions. And that's my first one. Are you holding fast, tight to God, fully committed to God? Let's go on to the second point, my second question. Verse 21. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at Bezor Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them, how they were but all the evil men and troublemakers among david's followers said because they did not go out with us we will not share with them the plunder we recovered mm -hmm. however each man may take his wife and children and go david replied no my brothers you must not do that with what the lord has given us he has protected us and delivered it into our hands the raiding party that came against us 
Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this statue an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. When David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemy. Plunder. <clears throat> so, my second point is hold fast to your brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Remain tightly secured. <laughs> hold fast to your brothers and sisters. So here you see, they got everyone back and they had this amazing plunder. And it said here that some evil men and troublemakers did not want to share the plunder. Uh, what's interesting here uh, is that uh, he's thinking about the future as well. Not only does he share the plunder with the brothers there, he also sends uh, some of the plunder to Judah. And uh, I appreciated, you know, John talking about that, thinking about our future. Uh, and I want to talk about a different kind of plunder, but let's just put that aside for a second. And let's just talk about the contribution, <laughs> the financial need uh, of the church. Um, so part of what Jill and I and, and the Spectrums talked about was how to be able to raise up leaders uh, so that we can tackle the field that God has given us. And so over the next few months, um, you know, every January we set a new budget for the church. And I'm hoping that you guys decide to help with the plunder, that we can be able to hire uh, the next generation to be able to lead a church to either Albany, Rochester, Buffalo, right? Uh, Tyrese and I were talking about Buffalo. He's like, I had a dream to go to Toronto, but we already have a church there. I'm like, let me show you something. <laughs> right across the street is Buffalo. <laughs> I said, I see it now. Five years from now, you and your wife and your beautiful kids. In five years, you reach a hundred disciples there at Buffalo. He's like, I'm going to go pray about that right now. <laughs> But what's that going to take? It's going to take the plunder. We've got to think of the future of the kingdom. And we need people in these cities. God has given us this territory. Amen? Amen. Um, so enough about that. Let's go back to the other plunder. Go to John chapter 13. Come on, Dave. I want to talk about the real plunder. I was having a great uh, discussion uh, with Diane. Jill and I were about how Jesus is the head of the church mm -hmm. and Jesus is the one that guides us and uh, we need to be loyal to the to the real royal which mm -hmm. is Jesus mm -hmm. I say amen mm -hmm. we do mm -hmm. <laughs> he is the head of the church John 13 here in uh, John 13 it starts off with him washing the disciples feet even Judas he washed his feet and he says see how I did this for you now you go and do this for your brothers. And then he predicts uh, his betrayal. And then he predicts Peter's denial. In verse 31, I'm sorry, verse 33, this is my children. I will be with you only a little longer. So in the midst of Jesus trying to teach them something, he's like, look, I'm only going to be with you just a little while longer. And so you can, you can sense that he's pleading here. Like this is super important. Verse 34, he says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. This is a plead. It's like, please, I'm only going to be with you just a little while. You got to understand this is what you need to do. See, we've been given, those of you that have been made into a disciple that have been baptized after you were a disciple to receive the Holy Spirit, you now have love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. You have that. You can walk with the Spirit. But some people in this room, troublemakers, do not want to share this plunder. You keep your love to yourself. Uh, just ask yourself, 
is there someone in this room that I would have a hard time inviting to my Thanksgiving dinner? I believe it's yes. And, and that can't be. Uh, look at um, Matthew chapter 24. You know, uh, growing up, uh, growing up, I mean, raising my children in the kingdom, uh, there were uh, times when they would fight. They're just normal kids, you know, brother, sister, a year apart, and they would fight over a toy or who got what, you know, just normal fights. And uh, I never dealt with the toy. It wasn't give the toy back. It wasn't uh, stop this or stop that. It was always let's sit down and let's talk about the real issue. You know what the real issue is? It's love. And I'd say, do you love your sister? Is this what love looks like? What does love look like? And we'd walk through the process of what love looks like. And then pretty soon, tears would be coming down. And they would recommit to love each other. Because nothing else matters. A toy doesn't matter. What matters is the love. The grades don't matter. It's the love. It's the love that matters. Look at chapter 24 in verse 12. This is our Lord Jesus who says this. He says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Most yeah. will grow cold. You know what the percentage of most is? At least 51%. Yeah. If I'm correct. Am I correct? Yeah. I see CMers. Okay. So, so look around. 51% of you are not going to make it. That's what it says. The love of most will grow cold. This is a serious issue. you got to hold fast to your brothers and to your sisters. You've got to be all in when it comes to preaching the gospel to the whole world. That's what he says right here. Those who stand firm to the end will preach the gospel to the whole world. What's that going to take? Love. You don't give your contribution. Why? Because you don't love. You don't give your missions. You don't try to go above and beyond. Why? Because you don't love. It's not a financial issue. It's not a situation issue. It's love. It's love. He says your heart will grow cold because you don't love your brothers and your sisters. Um, <clears throat> you don't have your weekly discipling times. You allow excuses to happen. It's a lack of love. That's what it is. We've got to recommit to loving each other. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. Are you guys with me? Yeah. I want you guys to make it. In verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him, who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Yes, Jesus is royalty, but you are royalty. That is not German. That is Jesus living in German. That is not Nicole. That is Jesus living in Nicole. Do you understand? You are royalty. And we need a loyalty to royalty. We need to hold fast to our brothers and sisters and treat each other like we are. Yeah. You would not treat some king that walks in bad. You would give him the best seat in the house. You would take him to a nice restaurant. You would take care of them. Are you even concerned about the brothers and sisters? How are they doing this Thanksgiving? You know, suicide rates go through the roof during this time of year. It's an emotional time. People start to remember uh, what it was like 
growing up, whether good or bad, and it can take you all over the place. They need to know that they have a real family here, that we're loyal to each other. Are you fully committed to your brothers and to your sisters? Mom. That's got to be our hearts. This is a command of Jesus. It's not an option. We got to love each other. That comes to uh, my third point. We got to hold fast unto death. Let's get back to 1 Samuel. Chapter 31. Loyalty to royalty. Chapter 31, 1 Samuel, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they killed his sons Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malachishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer, all his men died together that same day. This could be a, a sad moment. Uh, you see that Saul did not fulfill his purpose. But one key name in there fires me up. And that's his boy, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Jonathan dies. Jonathan was loyal. He was faithful. He was loyal to his father. He was loyal to David. And he was loyal to God. He knew that David was going to be the next king. He was a successor. And he could have taken that away from David. Uh, but he didn't. He knew what the plan was. And instead, he went to battle right next to his dad. And he dies. Mm -hmm loyal to his father to david and to god uh look over in acts chapter 13 really quick in verse 36 acts 13 36 it says now when david had served god's purpose in his own generation he fell asleep <laughs> Now, you shouldn't fall asleep in church. Amen? No. What it's saying here is that when he fulfilled his purpose, he dies. What does that mean? That it doesn't matter if you're 15 years old. Oh, no. You guys just turned 16. It doesn't matter if you're 16 or... Am I 56 or 55? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. I'm still alive, which means God has a purpose for my life. God has a purpose for your life. And see, to be loyal to God means you are about the purpose that he's given you. The difference between Saul and David was not the sin they committed. As a matter of fact, David sinned way more than, than Saul did. It was that he remained loyal to God. Amen. God sees that as the most important thing that we can do, is to be loyal to him and to be loyal to his people. Mm -hmm. Satan is going to try to take you out. He could even use someone in this church right now mm -hmm. to try to deceive you and then try to teach you some false doctrine that's going to take you out. Right. you got to be loyal to God. And loyal to God's people that he's put in your life. Amen. 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 God has a purpose for your life. As long as you are alive. Amen. Let's go back. 1 Samuel chapter 31. I was uh, talking to Terry. Uh, my brother Terry. And... I was probably too short with him, and uh, he's, he's such a gentle spirit, and uh, he sent me a, an email, and, and it made me cry, because he was like, I don't want to disappoint you. Uh, the campus has not had any Bible studies in two weeks, and so I was, I was short with him, like, come on, make it happen, and instead of encouraging him and loving him, 
I was short with him. And so he sent me that email. And so I realized what I did. And, and so he was, he was at the uh, basketball game last night. And so I pulled him aside and I apologized. And I said, look, you never can disappoint me. Uh, the only way you can disappoint me is to give up <laughs> and, and just don't give up. And that's gotta be our heart. We can never disappoint our father in heaven as long as we don't give up. Come on. Amen. Amen. I appreciate his heart. He just wants to do what's good. Uh, sometimes titles can mess us up, you know, yeah. the new leader, it can mess us up. Uh, or maybe we want a title and we're not going to do anything until we get a title. Like all that has got to go. We just got to be loyal to God. He's given us all a purpose. We're all disciples. We need to go and make disciples for Jesus. First Samuel 31. Verse 7. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled, and the Philistines came and occupied them. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut mm -hmm. off his head and stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idol and among their people. <laughs> so here, uh, uh, the Philistines are acting out some revenge. Um, if you remember, well, let's just go back. First Samuel chapter 11. When uh, Saul first becomes king, remember he was hiding in the baggage. He doesn't really want to be king. And so at this point in chapter 11, he's, uh, he's just tending a flock. And uh, these men at Jabesh, Gilead, um, they were told that if they don't cut out one of their eyes, they're all going to be killed. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And so when uh, Saul finds out, it says the Holy Spirit came on him. He cuts off some animals, spreads it all over the land and said, we're all going to come together and fight as one or I'm going to do this to you. Yeah. <laughs> He's an eloquent speaker. <laughs> Got them motivated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he defeats them and he saves this city, uh, Jabesh Gilead. And Jabesh Gilead isn't even part of God's people. He just went in to rescue them. Okay, now that you know this, go back to 1 Samuel 31. Verse 11. When the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their valiant men marched through the night to Beth Shan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan and went to Jabesh where they burned them. Then they took their bones and buried them under the Thomas tree at Jabesh, and they fasted seven days. Yeah, Saul didn't fulfill the purpose God had for him, but he did good. He did good. And we need to honor people in our lives that have done good for us and for others around them. Uh, I mean, in my worst teen years, <laughs> I had one or two father figures that stepped in to help me. Uh, Miguel Ochoa, he doesn't believe the same thing I believe, but uh, I love that man. I mean, in some of my darkest moments, he was there for me and guided me. Uh, there's people in your lives that maybe they're not sold out disciples of Jesus Christ, uh, or maybe they're part of a lukewarm church. Um, if they've done anything great and impacted you, we need to honor them. Saul was, was honored here by these valiant men. And so we can't look down on people. Um, what's interesting here is that they fasted for seven days. Yeah. Now, I was talking to some people about fasting. And uh, just so you know, in the Bible, nowhere in there does it say fast from desserts or fast from your cell phone or fast from reading or fast from watching tv fasting means you don't eat food yeah, right. and then when you feel that rumbling in your belly it reminds you to pray to god yeah Amen. and to draw close to god Amen. and so i had two questions for you today i said are you fully committed to god i believe the answer is no i said are you fully committed to your brothers and your sisters and i believe the answer is no and so i'm calling the church 
to fast. Join me. Uh -huh. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to fast. I'm going to break that fast with all of you on Tuesday night when we have together. Um, and I'm asking you to do that. Fast with me. And I want you to pray to be fully committed to God and fully committed to each other. Yeah. And that you'll never give up, ever. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, some of you might have like uh, health problems. Um, I, I was talking to Mary, I want to be sensitive. So maybe you'll have to drink some orange juice or something like that. Uh, amen. Fast. Fast. Get committed to God. Amen. Let's close out in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Hold fast unto death. Here in uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, John writes down the very words of Jesus as he speaks to each one of the seven churches. And so I want us to look, starting with the word victorious. In each church, he lifts them up and he rebukes them. And then he ends with the word victorious with each one of the churches. Starting in verse 1, you see... It's to the church in Ephesus. And in verse 7, halfway down, it says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Church number 2, Smyrna, verse 11, halfway down, says, The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Church number 3, Pergamum, verse 17, Second sentence, to the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Church 4, Thyatira, verse 26, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Chapter 3, verse 1, Sardis. In verse 5, it says, the one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my father and his angels. Church 5, or 6, Philadelphia. Verse 12, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. The seventh church, Laodicea, verse 21. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Loyalty to royalty and to God be all the glory. Amen.